Hello, this is Pastor Roy Blight at Beit Mashiach, Messiah House here in Lake Worth, Florida. And tonight, as we look at our Torah portion, this is Torah portion number nine, Vayeshev, and he settled. And this is one that is all about who the Messiah is. And it's an exciting teaching for me because it gets into some of the deep layered prophecies that are in the Bible about Yeshua, the Messiah, and we're excited to, to go there. So again, remember that this is Torah Tuesday, and we want you to, this is a deep dive into the subject of Vayeshev, and he settled as we talk about Joseph and all that he went through in his life as well. So let us get started here, and we'll begin... Now, as we realize what's going on here, we understand that we're looking at a lot of the things that are symbolism. We're looking at types, shadows, and patterns. And in particular, we're looking at the life and the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. So we'll be starting in Matthew chapter 1, and we'll be touching different aspects of the gospel of Matthew and other gospels as well as we look at this subject because it's a big important subject when you look at who the Messiah is well certainly the, the the claim of Jesus is the most profound and the most obvious one on planet earth and nobody comes close to uh, detailing in in advance the things that Jesus did through the word of God through the Torah so we want to ask the question whose son is the Messiah <clears throat> it's a good question. It's a very important question. And the Lord puts it right out there in, the, in such a uh, fact-based way that there's really no doubt when you left. And I want to look at, first of all, the word paradox. We want to understand exactly what a paradox is. The definition of a paradox is a statement whose two parts seem con contradictory, yet makes sense with more thought. So we see a lot of this when we study the Gospels of Jesus Christ, and especially as it concerns his genealogy. For example, a, 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 an example of a paradox would be when you hear in the scripture, they have ears, but hear not, or deep down, he's very shallow. A paradox attracts the reader's or the listener's attention and gives emphasis to a certain point that's there. So we're looking at the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, as it says in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. And, and remember that <clears throat> Yeshua said in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. So we know that Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, is, is from, from heaven. He's, from, he's eternal. He's always been there. And he, and he knew Abraham before Abraham uh, was even born. And he said in John 8, before Abraham was, I am. So we're looking at in the very beginning. It says in John, at 1 John 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest, <clears throat> manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we see that in the very first verse in John 1, 1 also says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, talking about Jesus the Messiah. And it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. These are the, this is the word of God in the Gospel of John describing who the Messiah is. It says also, Paul wrote to the Colossians <clears throat> concerning, <clears throat> excuse me, concerning the same subject. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's given you an idea and a glimpse into his being eternal coming from heaven to planet earth. So as we look at this, we realize now the backdrop of the gospel of Matthew, because it, it, Matthew starts in verse 18 saying, Now the birth of Yeshua HaMashiach was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just or righteous or Torah-keeping man, 
and not wanting to make a, her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So this is the Messiah coming to planet Earth. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Remember the name Yeshua. Yeshua in Hebrew means salvation. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Yeshua, which is again salvation. God with us, Emmanuel, El Nu Ima, God with us. This is very important to understand. It says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. It's talking about the Messiah coming to planet Earth, as spoken through the prophet Isaiah. So as we look at the genealogy of Jesus, we understand that this is something that is major. This is something that is sublime. This is something that is so wonderful. And we look at this. So the reading from the book of Matthew concerns the promised seed of Abraham, who was to be the Messiah. And this is what the fulfillment is all about. Mashiach Yeshua, or Jesus the Messiah, whose genealogy is given through the lineage of Yeshua's legal father, who was Joseph, beginning with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we're setting it up here, and the, the scripture is setting it up here to let you know exactly who the Messiah is. We see his line then go through Judah, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, through Judah, and his son Perez, to Jesse the father of King David, and finally from David to Solomon. And you see the appearance here of his of this genealogy that is spoken of in Matthew chapter 1, and it, 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 the, it, he appears as the, the father is, the genealogy of Jesus appears to be human. His human father, Joseph, his lineage is pointed out. And you see Judah, he was the Judah's father or son was Perez, all the way down to Solomon, and then see down there Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, is spoken of. And none of this is by accident. Matthew does this to demonstrate that Yeshua is indeed a descendant of King David, and therefore eligible to be the Mashiach, the Messiah awaited for by the children of Israel. Jesus was right there. He was born in Bethlehem. He's from the tribe of Judah. He fulfills every prophecy given about the coming of the Messiah. So and this is Mashiach ben David. This is the, the one that the Jews are looking for even today. And this is the one who's going to come in as, as the monarch, as the, as the towering king of Israel. This is Mashiach ben David. For a child, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will 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 be upon his shoulders. So how many governments, how many kingdoms do you see? The Samaritan woman at the well asked Yeshua, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So all these questions are being asked. And Yeshua said, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Then Jesus spoke to her and said, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation, or Yeshua, is of the Jews. And we see this is such a fulfillment of so many things. For example, in Psalm 78, it says, Moreover, he rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. This is a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah being from the tribe of Judah. And it goes on, it says, and he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he has established forever. He also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes that had young he brought him, to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them, 
according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So we see that that this is looking at the the Joseph that is in the old covenant, the son of, of Judah or son of Jacob, and it's also referring to the Messiah of Israel. And that's why it says in Matthew 1.21, and she will bring forth a son. It's talking about Israel. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is actually talking about the Virgin Mary and what she was going to do in bringing forth the Messiah child to planet Earth. Remember again, Yeshua means salvation. And understand also that in the Bible, every name matters. The meaning of every name matters. There's nothing that is out of place. Everything is nuanced in such a way that it has a powerful, uh, it has a powerful story behind it. Every name, when you look at it, and God has it there for us. So let's continue now with the genealogy of Yeshua. This is God's genealogy of grace that we see within this genealogy of Yeshua, and it is amazing when you look at it and you look at what God's heart is trying to tell us. It's an amazing fact that the genealogy of Yeshua the Messiah includes this, the line of Lot with his firstborn daughter through the birth of their son Moab. Remember the, uh, the incestual relationship that Lot had with his daughters. The Moabitess Ruth, who was the great grandmother of King David, so she wasn't Jewish at all, she was a Moabitess. Ruth herself married Boaz, who was a descendant of Salmon of the tribe of Judah, and his wife, who was Rahab the harlot, who also was not a Hebrew, and she had been a harlot, but she helped uh, with the conquering of the uh, land of Jericho, the city of Jericho. The union, also in this genealogy of the Messiah, you see the union of Judah and Tamar, which led to the birth of Perez, from whom came King David. So you see, this it, it sounds almost very, pretty seedy, doesn't it? Then you see the union of David with Bathsheba mentioned because this is where Solomon came from, and this was born in adultery itself as well. So what message, if any, is the Lord conveying when you see this in the genealogy of Yeshua given in Matthew 1, 1 through 16? Only four women beside Mary are explicitly named. One was Tamar, who seduced the father of her late husband. Two was Rahab, who had been a prostitute. Three, Ruth, who was a Moabitess and Beth Bathsheba, an adulteress and the wife of Uriah, who also was not, was not a Jew. So understand, this is in the genealogy of our Lord. And it goes back to the his, his coming to planet Earth in humility. Remember, it says in Isaiah 53, 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And his human likeness was as human as you could possibly get. That was our Messiah coming to planet Earth. That is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords coming to visit mankind from his throne in heaven. That's why it says in Luke also, it says, and there was delivered unto him, this is when Jesus went, went to his own hometown to, to deliver the Torah portion that day. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. We understand that the Messiah came to planet Earth, and there he was in all his humility of, of this carpenter from Nazareth, going into the synagogue and preaching and fulfilling the scriptures as the Father sent him to do. And Jesus said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And it says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? So they're wondering, who is this? And they, their answer was right before their faces. And we saw that he's, he's portrayed as Yeshua ben David, son of David. 
And now we're going to understand our Torah portion today with Joseph, because Yeshua the Messiah is also Mashiach ben Yosef. This we see in the tradition of Judaism about Mashiach ben Yosef. They know they talk about it all the time. And who will he be? The, the suffering servant, which is so obvious to, to the believer in Jesus, because our eyes are not blinded because of our unbelief, because unbelief is a spirit of blindness. And, and many Jewish people, they can't accept Jesus because they're blinded by their unbelief. They're looking right at Jesus Christ, and he is Mashiach ben Yosef. Oh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Because it says in Genesis 49, 22, the blessing that Jacob gave to Joseph, that Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine by a fountain. Its branches run over the wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility. But his bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Talking about how Joseph, the brother of the the other 11 brothers of Jacob was, was spared his life, even though he was thrown into slavery and all those things that happened to him that were awful. God protected him. And this is a type of Christ that we're looking at here. Now we know Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, was born of the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Joseph. He came to make peace and to bring the house of Judah and the house of Ephraim back together in unity. And when we look carefully, we see so many parallels between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus. It's amazing when you look at it in every way. Nothing in the scripture is there by accident. It's ironic that the people of Nazareth and the Galilee knew him as the son of Joseph. That's who he was. This is the carpenter's son. He's the son of Joseph. This is Yeshua. That's who he is. But Joseph, the one that's in the Bible in Genesis, that we're studying today is there as a type of Christ. And we see there's so many characteristics and attributes of them both that are tied together. Both were despised. Both went into Egypt. Both returned from Egypt. Both were arrested. Both were falsely accused. Both resisted temptation and sin. Both were separated from their fathers. Both had great power and authority. Both, both were sold. Both showed great love. Both uh, helped preserve life. Both were found alive. Both were reunited with their brethren. Both showed compassion. Both showed, both showed pardon. And both, God was with both of them. This is very important to understand. And there's more you know, parallels to the life of Joseph and the life of Yeshua. But those are just some of the main ones that we're looking at. Joseph is a type of the Messiah. He is Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah, the son of Joseph. That is exactly what the suffering servant, Jesus the Messiah, came as 2,000 years ago. And people that reject him today are rejecting the only way of salvation there is for anyone, Jew or Gentile, in all mankind. Jesus is the, the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the Savior of the world. And to reject him is to reject salvation because then again, as we've said before, Yeshua and salvation are the same thing. That's why Paul wrote to the Philippians, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. He came in the likeness of Joseph and of David. He was Mashiach ben David. He was also Mashiach ben Yosef. He came in the likeness of Joseph and David so we could recognize him. Of course, he fit the mold. The mold was made in his image. Now our goal is to become more and more like that mold. And that's the goal of every follower of Jesus the Messiah today. It says, that's what Paul wrote to the Romans. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So we see this is the Lord's working in the lives through the Messiah, who is, and Joseph is a type of the Messiah. 
And that's why a lot of the conflict we see today, it's set up by those who were brothers who don't believe in who jo they didn't believe who Joseph was, and they don't believe who Jesus was. And that's why when you get into the Gospel of Mark, in Mark 12, 13, it says, And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. They sent the religious crowd who, who didn't want to have any have anything to do with him. They sent their 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 biggest weapons, the 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 those that were the Pharisees and the Herodians, to catch him in his words so they could trip him up. And it says, one of the scribes came and heard them arguing. And so recognizing that he answered well, he asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? He's asking the Lord. And Jesus answered, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Remember, he made himself equal with the Father. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him. And then Yeshua said, you're not far from the kingdom. And he, I wonder what he understood about the kingdom at all. So we have this question. We have this, this these enormity of paradoxes that are all over the place and we're looking at. But the question becomes, whose son is the Messiah? And it's obvious to most of us that believe and trust in Jesus, the son of the Messiah, the, that's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is exactly who we're talking about. And this is the question that is put before these religious elders then. And it's and it says in Mark 12, And while teaching in the temple, Jesus said in answer, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I set your enemies as your footstool. Therefore David himself calls him Lord. And so how can he be his son? And a great multitude listened to him willingly, because he's describing Mashiach ben David coming from the mouth of David himself. And David called him Lord. And David, King David, David, he in calling him Lord, it, you have to understand that this is huge before this re religious crowd. You see, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Because the Lord is dealing with the hearts of men. Those who are so proud are blinded and those who are humble see. And that is why the, the, the very... Uh, the, the common people could understand who the Mashiach was and is, and the religious crowd, they rejected him even then because of who they are in their hearts. And God has chosen to do these things, the foolish of the things of the world, to take away the, the understanding of those who think that they're wise. It says, so the honor, and Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2, 7, <clears throat> so the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. This is a prophecy from Isaiah of exactly what the Messiah was going to do with those who thought they knew everything and how God was, make, was going to make his own son a rock of offense before those religious people who thought they know everything. They, Peter wrote, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. You see, the Lord set it up this way in order for those to come to him, must come to him through the Son of God. And we're talking about an everlasting life here. This is precisely what this Torah portion is getting into. In John 10, it says, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. This is the, what, the words that the Lord spoke to those who didn't believe in him. He spoke to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribe, the Herodians, the politicians, the soldiers, anybody that didn't believe in him because he knows who his sheep are. But he said, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Are you his sheep? Are you one of his today? If you don't believe in Jesus, you're not his sheep. You're on the outside and there's, there's no hope for your salvation. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. 
I know them, and they follow me. That's the characteristics of a follower of Jesus. We hear his voice, and we do what he tells us to do. The Lord said, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, of course. I and the Father are one. And in saying this, this infuriated the religious crowd. But remember, they didn't believe. They were on the outside looking in, and they were not one of Yeshua's sheep. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 8, 29. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Also, John wrote in 1 John 5, 5, Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It's quite simple. It's quite plain. There's many witnesses to it. You trying to become a good person is not going to give you salvation. The only thing that's going to bring you salvation and me salvation is our belief in who Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, really is. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of the living God, and he's coming back soon. He's the living Son of the living God, the one we've all been looking for all these centuries. And this is the crux of the discussion that we're finding in our Torah portion today. Jesus said, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This happens when you're born again of the Spirit, as you believe in Jesus. Now it says in John 7, Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard the saying, said, Truly this is a prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. They didn't know where Jesus had been born. He was, he, he was known to be from Nazareth, which is in the northern part in the Galil or Galilee. And he, the land he, he was from was from one of the other tribes, Naphtali or, or Asher, or one of them. And But the Jews were known to be from Judea. But Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which is in Judea. So the Lord asked in Matthew 16, he asked Peter, Who do men say that I am? This is the crux of the issue. And, and he went around asking them, and he said, But what about you? He asked, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This is, the, this is the answer that we all must answer before the Lord. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Your answer will determine your destiny eternally. And Yeshua said to him, Jesus said to Peter, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now what he's saying is because of this, because of this revelation that Peter had of who Jesus the Messiah is, it opens up everything that the Lord has for him and for you and for me. And we understand that this is what we are living for, that we live for the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is all about the Messiah, the Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef, the, the, the Messiah, the Christ, the one, the Savior of the world. And if you believe that, the keys of God's kingdom are there, standing there for you, even right now. You see, we understand also that because we have this information God has given to us, revelation, the revelation that God has always brings responsibility. Remember, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what, how we live, what we say, what we do, what we think, how we feel, how we live our life does matter, and we need to realize that. So that is the New, portion, New Testament portion uh, of our Torah portion today. Who is Jesus Christ? And in looking at the genealogy, we see it's very clear, of course, in the New Covenant. It's talking about the New Covenant that God gave to us because the Son of God came to planet Earth. Now let us look at more at, at Joseph and understand more about Messiah ben Yosef. And all that this, all that he went through in order to be a type of Christ himself. This is parasha number nine. It's Vayeshev, and he settled from Genesis 37 to chapter 40, 23. Now, 
when we look at this, we realize this is the story about Joseph and, and the problems that he was having with his brothers. And it, it's named Bayashev, which means, and he dwelt. It's, now, the title comes from the first verse of the reading, which says, now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. And this is where it begins, but it's really not the, the subject matter we'll be discussing here. This week's parasha begins with Jacob living back in the promised land to Abraham and Isaac with his 12 sons, but the narrative quickly turns to Jacob's favorite son, Joseph, who was 17 years old at the time. He was a teenager. The narrative tells of Joseph's troubles with his brothers and how he was forcibly removed from the land of Canaan and dwelt in Egypt. The parasha follows Joseph from Canaan to Egypt to prison. In addition, this week's Torah portion contains the story of Judah and Tamar, which we'll be getting to. So this is the backdrop. So to begin the parasha of Vayeshev, we read, Jacob settled, or Vayeshev Yaakov, in the land of his father, sojourning in the land of Canaan. Again, the story immediately turns to the story of Joseph, who was 17 years old at the time, and it says, and these were the generations of Jacob. Notice it says Joseph being 17 years old. Now notice that the toldo, the genealogy of Jacob, begins with Joseph rather than Reuben, who is the firstborn son of Leah. Joseph was actually the 11th brother born. It does seem that the Torah is suggesting that Joseph is to be regarded by Jacob as his chosen or firstborn son, certainly his favorite son. Now, note in this narrative of our parasha that you'll see that the slides are intended to show a parallel between the lives of Joseph and Yeshua framed in gold, and you'll see it, and it's very pretty obvious throughout. For example, you have the coat, of the his coat of uh, different colors. Jacob and Joseph undoubtedly shared a lot in common, and this surely caused Jacob to prefer his firstborn son of Rachel over his other sons. There was a reason he was the favorite. He was born of, of, of Rachel, who was his beloved, and he had a lot in common with Joseph. For instance, both men had infer infertile mothers who had difficulty in childbirth. Both mothers bore two sons, and both were hated by their brothers. In addition, the Torah states that Jacob loved Joseph more than all his other sons since he was the son of his old age and was the firstborn son of his beloved wife, Rachel. Indeed, Jacob made him an ornamented tunic to indicate his special status in the family. This was his coat of many colors. And according to the scholars, the coat of many colors was the same garment Leah and Rachel wore on their wedding nights, and later was set aside for the family heir to possess. So it was an important deal amongst this family. Reuben was the firstborn. But since Reuben violated Rachel's handmaid, Billa, Jacob gave the garment to Joseph, thereby, thereby designating him as the appointed heir of Israel, the heir of the family. Paul wrote to the Romans, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So you see the parallels that is going on here in the scriptures. Paul wrote, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit <clears throat> that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So we are not just followers of Jesus Christ, we're also joint heirs with him. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ is what Paul wrote. So this is important. And remember the life of Joseph now comes into play because Joseph is a type of this Christ who is our fellow heir as well. As the favorite son, Joseph's job was to oversee the activity of Jacob's other sons and to bring reports about their activities back to Joseph. You might say he was, he was something the brothers resented was they saw him as a snitch. It says in John 5, do not, this is the words of Jesus. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you, had, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So we see that this, this going on in the family, these family matters were very real. However, 
this role as overseer for Joseph and preferred son was too much for the other brothers. And they soon became jealous of him and they hated him and they wanted to do away with him. To make matters worse, Joseph related several dreams to his brothers that foretold that he was destined to rule over them. I'm sure as a young teenager, this wasn't the wisest thing to do politically, but he did have the dreams and he spoke about them. This only increased their envy and hatred of him. The implication of the dreams was that all of Jacob's family would become subservient to him someday, and this is in a dream. And remember what it says about the, the suffering well, Messiah, the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected. Precisely what happened to Joseph and his brothers is precisely what happened with Yeshua, Jesus, and his brothers. Jacob rebuked Joseph for arousing his brother's hatred, but he inwardly took note and waited for the fulfillment of the dreams. He didn't know exactly what was going on, but he took him in, and, and he, he probably realized something was up, and he didn't even realize what was up. So you have Joseph now is, is being sold into slavery by his brothers, it says in the scripture. One day the brothers took the herds over near Shechem, the place where Simeon and Levi, the two hot-headed sons of Leah, had earlier killed all the town's inhabitants on account of the rape of their sister, Dina. Jacob, perhaps still concerned about the reputation he had in the area, sent Joseph to check up on their welfare. Joseph, however, learned that his brothers had left for Dothan and followed them there. So we have this, this long trek of the, the shepherds going out, and Joseph is following after his brothers. Upon arriving in Dothan, the brothers saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And it says, from that day forth, they took counsel together to put him to death. That's talking about Jesus, but isn't it precisely what happened with Joseph as well? They were looking at the life of the Messiah, and they conspired to put him to death. Jo the Mashiach ben Yosef is Jesus the Messiah. This is one of the other, one of the obvious parallels that is there. Now, as they were conspiring to take Joseph, however, Reuben, the disgraced firstborn son, remember, tried to circumvent their plan by suggesting that they merely throw him into a pit to shake him up a bit, secretly planning to come back later to rescue him. And he, he saw, you know, he was involved, with, but he didn't want to murder him. When Joseph finally arrived, they stripped him of his coat of many colors, and as Reuben suggested, threw him into a nearby pit. Then they sat down to eat, and the parallels with what happened with Yeshua are very similar as well. It says in Matthew 27, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe, very much wanting to put him to death. Remember that the story of Jacob, or the story of Joseph, and the story of Jesus completely parallel one another. Soon the brothers noticed some of their distant cousins, the Midianites, descended from Ishmael, driving a caravan bearing spices to Egypt. Then one of the 12 who's called, remember, this is the same kind of thing that happened with Judas in, in the, the Gospels. Then one of the 12 who's called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. Now we get back to Joseph. Judas suggested it would be better to sell Joseph as a slave to them and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. Of course, this is going back to, to uh, Judas. And so you see this parallel going back if they're bargaining for the life of Joseph, as they were also bargaining for the life of Jesus. The brothers, going back to Joseph, agreed to this new plan, sold Joseph for 20 shekels of silver, and watched as Joseph was bound and taken away to Egypt. And we see that this, this, this happened, and we wonder about how their hearts really felt. Getting back to the betrayal and the life of Jesus, remember it says in Matthew 2, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So we see that the life of Jesus is at stake, just as the life of Joseph was at stake. And notice that Egypt is, is involved in both of their lives. 
and the, the lies again mirror each other and parallel one another. Now back to the story of Joseph, Reuben, away while this happened, returned to find that Joseph was gone and tore his clothes in horror and dismay. The brothers then decided to fake Joseph's death by dipping his coat of many colors into goat's blood and bringing it to their father, who mistakenly inferred that his son had been killed by a wild animal, and realized that Joseph had no real understanding of what actually had happened, and he thought that his son Joseph was dead and that his life was over. And remember that this, again, parallels the, the suffering servant that we find in Jesus, the Messiah, Mashiach ben Yosef. Remember what it says, why it's it's not possible for the blood of, boat, of bulls and goats to take away sins. Notice the irony here. Jacob had deceived his forefather with goat skins. Remember when he tricked Esau and put the goat skins on his own body. And now his sons deceived him with the, with the blood of a goat. He never escaped the justice of God. Jacob then mourned Joseph for many days. And of course, it says in John 19, at the death of Jesus, they will look on the one they have pierced. There was Jesus in front of all mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, and still is before all mankind. The last time mankind has seen him publicly was when he was on the cross. Since then, only believers have seen him. And of course, this is a fulfillment of what the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah received in chapter 12, 10. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Again, the parallels are amazing. So getting back to Joseph. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold Joseph to an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh named Potiphar, the captain of the guard. And of course, there's, there's a prophecy that, that touches all of these things in Psalm 22, verse 1. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? You see, this was obviously going to be the cry of Joseph as he is in prison. And it's exactly what Yeshua cried out from the cross in fulfillment of, the, of his of death and the fulfillment of his dying for our sins. So then the story in the Torah stops precisely right there, and it goes into the story of Judah and Tamar. It's amazing how it just stops all the, the flow, the entire drama stops, and it goes right to Judah and Tamar. Now the story of Joseph is now interrupted to relate an incident in the life of Judah, who separated from his brothers, married a Canaanite woman named Shua, and had three children, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. So this is this is set up. When his eldest son Ur came of age, Judah married him to a Canaanite woman named Tamar. However, Ur was wicked in the eyes of the Lord and died childless. So Judah promised her his second son, Onan. This was according to the custom of liberate marriage, that is, the brother of a man who dies childless is obligated to give a child to his brother's widow, and Judah was following through on this. The child was to be raised in his brother's name with his brother's inheritance of the land. This is how things were done. According to the, the scholars, the story of Judah and Tamar represents the axiom that God creates the cure before the plague. Before the new Pharaoh was born who would enslave Israel, the seed of the line of the Messiah Israel's deliverer and redeemer was planted. It's all everything was already in place. And in a rather precarious way was it put in place. You see, when you go back to Judah and Tamar now, so Judah promised her, Tamar, his second son, Onan. Onan sinned by spilling a seed to avoid the obligation, and the Lord slew him for this. So the second son of Judah is now dead. At this point, Judah was reluctant to give his third son to marry Tamar, and there was Tamar, and she was there, and she was she was without a husband. She had no future. She they don't they didn't have social security. They didn't have inheritance for her at all. She was just there. Judah misled Tamar by telling her he would do so, allow that he would do so as soon as Sheila came of age, and Sheila came of age, and nothing happened. 
So after realizing that Judah was not going to fulfill his promise to give his son Sheila in marriage to her, Tamar disguised herself as a prostitute and seduced Judah herself. Later, Judah heard that his daughter-in-law had become pregnant and ordered her burned alive for harlotry. But when Tamar produced his pledge of payment to her for her services, he publicly confessed that he was the father. Tamar gave birth to twin sons, Zara and Perez, the latter being an ancestor of King David and through him, Yeshua the Messiah. So we see that this, this is part of the genealogy of our Messiah even now. After this account of Judah and Tamar, the Torah portion resumes the saga of Joseph, who was sold to Potiphar, who was the captain of the guard. And despite the injustice and treachery of his brothers, all that had Joseph had gone through, his heart and his, his heart, his spirit was unaffected. They were still proper before the Lord. And the Lord was with Joseph, and the Lord blessed everything that he did, and he walked in the blessing of God. In fact, soon he was promoted to be the head of Potiphar's entire household. It says in chapter 39, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served them. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had, he had except for the bread which, of which he ate. Now the Torah describes Joseph as a handsome and formal appearance, and soon Potiphar's wife began soliciting him to have an affair with her. It says in verse 8, But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what it is, does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph steadfastly refused her repeated advances, but one day she threw herself upon him when he when no one else was in the house. It's Remember what it says in Hebrews chapter 4. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So this Messiah ben Joseph, he went through the temptation of trying to be lured by this woman, and he steadfastly refused her advances. When Joseph tried to flee from her grasp, she caught him by the garment and pulled it off before he ran from the house. Humiliated, she then decided to slander Joseph and falsely accused him to her husband of attempted rape. You see, this is another thing that happened. Both Joseph and Jesus were falsely accused. It says in Mark 14, the, when Je after Jesus was arrested, the false accusers came and they said, We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days we'll build another, not made by hands. They completely had no idea what they were talking about. Again, back in Joseph's day, Potiphar was outraged and threw young Joseph into the royal dungeon. But again, God showed him favor there, and he immediately gained the trust and admiration of his jailers, who appointed him to a position of authority in the prison administration. So everywhere he went, he prospered. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's assault authority, because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. You see, you have to understand that God's hand was upon Joseph as it was upon the, the Mashiach ben Joseph. It says that in Matthew 28, authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority, Jesus said, has been given to him on he in heaven and on earth. And he gave this, this power and authority to those of us who walk with him. 
In Genesis 39, 3, it says, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So again, Joseph is a type of the Messiah, because even now, jo Joseph, who is with Messiah, Jesus runs everything. He has all authority in heaven and on earth, and the authority that Joseph had is a type of that authority that he wielded, and he showed while he was in charge of Egypt, except for the Pharaoh on planet earth. And the prophet Isaiah alludes to this. It says, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. You see the, the power and authority of what, of what Yeshua did for us reverberates in us as believers. That's why Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And we are. We are totally dependent upon him because all authority in heaven and on earth are given to the Messiah and we move in him. Now, getting back to Joseph, it says, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. And, and the parasha ends with events in Joseph's life that eventually would bring him to the attention of Pharaoh himself, which we will be getting into in next week's parasha. While in prison, Joseph met Pharaoh's wine steward and chief baker, both incarcerated for offending their master. Both men had disturbing dreams, which Joseph correctly interpreted. In three days, he told them, the wine steward would be released, but the baker would be hanged. Joseph then asked the wine steward to advocate for his release with Pharaoh, but it took him a while. Joseph's predictions were fulfilled, but the wine steward forgot all about Joseph and did nothing for him. Remember what was said in, by, the, by the psalmist in Psalm 22.1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, you can see Joseph in his natural self crying this out before the Lord. Lord, you are the God who... Who, you're the God who saves me. Sorry, I couldn't read it there very well. Let my, it says in Psalm 86 2 or 88 2, let my prayer reach you. Turn your ear to my outcry. See, these are cries from people that are serving the Lord. And there are times we always need to be crying out to the Lord. But it goes on in Psalm 88 For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that you have laid me in the lowest pit in the darkest depths. So understand, every one of us goes through these things, but the Lord is the one who places us where we are. You have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I am shut up and cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. So we see that this is where the Torah portion ends, and understand that Joseph was the suffering servant, the son of Joseph, Messiah ben Joseph, Mashiach ben Yosef. He is the one who, like Joseph, came as the suffering servant, but is now resurrected from the dead, and he has all power and authority. What a glorious story this is that we see in our Torah portion about the life of Joseph and what he went through to get where God wanted them to be. And as we continue now, as we finish up with our Torah portion today, we're going into the half Torah, and we're looking at the prophet Amos from Amos 6, Amos 2, 6 to 3, 8. Amos was a shepherd who tended, a, who tended sycamore trees when he was called by God to be a prophet sometime during the reign of Jeroboam II, which was 786 to 746 BC. The northern kingdom of Israel, Ephraim, was very prosperous at the time, and the wealthy lived in palaces and behaved like <clears throat> the ungodly, while the poor were exploited and sold into slavery if they could not pay their debts. So it was a thriving, it was a thriving place to live. And, it's, and the words of Amos, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. 
Now the leaders of the people were entirely corrupt, and Amos was called upon to express God's anger at the Israelites who were no longer living by the commandments given in the Torah. It says in verse 7, they pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, meaning they trample on them, and pervert the way of, way of or shove the humble. A man and his father go to the same girl to defile my holy name. They lie, they lie down by every altar, even the pagan, on clothes taken in pledges or as security, and drink the wine of the condemned, the condemned for not paying unjust fines in the house of their God or their idol. So we see this is what's going on. Corruption had taken over this prosperous society. In this Haftorah portion, Amos, pro, Amos's prophecy against Israel is the climax of seven preceding reproofs directed against the various surrounding nations. His prophecy opened with, Thus said the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, even for four, I will not revoke it. Amos railed at the judges of Israel for their willingness to take bribes of silver, thereby repeating the crime of the brothers of Joseph, selling the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. Nothing had changed in the hearts of, these, of this family of Israel. Remember that after throwing Joseph into the pit, his brothers decided to sell him for 20 shekels of silver. He reminded them, the, of events that they had witnessed. It says, but as many as, but as my people watched, I destroyed the Amorites, who were the Canaanite nations, though they were as tall as cedars and as strong as oaks. I destroyed the fruit of their branches and dug out their roots. And through the Lord, and, and again in Jeremiah 25, it says, and though the Lord has sent all his servants, the prophets to you again and again, you have not listened or paid any attention. And this was a continual lament by the Lord against his people who had turned their back on him. And going back to Amos, it says, I chose some of your sons to be prophets and others to be Nazarites. Can you deny this, my people Israel? Asked the Lord. But you caused the Nazarites to sin by making them drink wine. And you commanded the prof prophets, shut up. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord has not done it? For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? And we see this is the, this is the angst that the Lord had that was spoken through Amos to the people. And this coincides also with what we see going on in Matthew 23 between the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and the religious uh, corrupt people that were around him. That's why he says in Matthew 29, 23, 29, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your father's guilt, serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and per persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So God was speaking his indignation and his judgment on those who were corrupt. Then Yeshua said in verse 37, something very familiar to us. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your house has left you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Of course, we're very familiar with this in our Messianic community because it, it said, Baruch Habab Hashem Adonai or Baruch Habab Hashem Yehovah. 
because blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, our God, Jehovah. This is the Messiah. This is a prophecy about Messiah, and he is coming. That's why the prophet Amos said in 5, 6, Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it with no one to quench it in Bethel. You see, this is judgment being spoke. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you. As you have spoken, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Remember, Jesus is Mashiach ben Yosef, the son of Joseph. And the prophet Isaiah spoke, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. They will become one. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people that is left from Assyria, as there was for Israel when they came up from Egypt. I will bring my exalt my I, I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands, and they will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again. They will plant vineyards and gardens, they will eat their crops and drink their wine. I will firmly plant them there in their land. They will never again be uprooted from, from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. This is what Amos is speaking to the redeemed people. So as we finish this Torah portion today, the completeness of it, this is a very amazing study looking at the life of Joseph, paralleling perfectly the life of Jesus Christ. And we see that Joseph, as a type of Christ, fulfills everything. He was the, remember, he was the, the servant of the Lord whose, whose heart was not changed. There's so many things about him that are perfectly in line with exactly who the Messiah is and what he did when he was on planet Earth. So this ends our Torah portion today. I hope you've enjoyed it. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.